Great. Thank you very much, uh, Kawaljit. Um, uh, thanks again to the organizers for asking us to uh, present. Um, for me, it's a great pleasure to be here with you uh, on this, uh, uh, this very important uh, workshop. The goal of this, I think, is shared by everyone who participated, both in the development of the workshop and I'm sure as well as the attendees, is to find ways to advance the development of the medical devices that specifically address the needs of children uh, through the process of evaluation um, and uh, regulatory process as well as the commercialization process. So my background um, is a clinical background. I've been performing uh, congenital cardiac surgery pretty much my entire career for over 20 years. I have done research work as well. However, over the last 10 years or so, my focus uh, of the laboratory work has been to develop um, medical devices with a specific application uh, for pediatric cardiac problems. I have participated in the uh, Pediatric Device Consortium um, project that FDA uh, sponsored. In fact, it's one of the early um, uh, consortium centers uh, that started that program uh, many years ago um, and uh, continue to be involved in this, uh, in this effort. Uh, I will turn it over again to my, um, my colleague, Dr. Nolan, uh, who is my co-presenter. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, likewise, it's also uh, my pleasure to be participating in today's discussion and presenting uh, with Dr. Del Nito. My name is Ryan Nolan. I'm the VP of Clinical Operations and co-founder of Photonicare. Um, I co-founded this startup company uh, uh, several years ago with two colleagues of mine. Um, I'm a biomedical engineer by training, and pediatric medical devices is are a passion of mine. So it's a pleasure to be participating uh, in, in our discussion today. Uh, I look forward to a productive panel, and uh, should anyone have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. So we'll um, go on with a presentation, but first, um, before I do that, I think it's important to acknowledge the efforts that have gone on uh, in, the, in the development process of this uh, workshop. First of all, the concept of, the, uh, uh, of using specific case studies uh, as a concrete way to uh, discuss all the topics relevant to pediatric device development uh, was a brainchild of many, um, and many made a contribution uh, to this um, particular program. I've listed there the contributors. Um, this is uh, a, probably an incomplete list because I think many, many other uh, um, participants in this workshop have made important contributions. At the end of the uh, two, uh, two presentations my, from myself and Dr. Nolan, or Mr. Nolan, uh, we will then have a panel discussion uh, to address some of the questions that we will raise both during the presentations and have also been raised previously during the introductory uh, uh, talks. The goal of the case studies is simply to provide examples. It is in no way intended to be exclusive. Um, we picked two types of devices that are uh, uh, representative of the kinds of um, uh, impactful uh, de medical devices that can be developed uh, and are needed in the pediatric uh, uh, world. Um, the first one is going to be a therapeutic device. It's a new heart valve. And the reason for picking this is that it is a, it's within the highest risk uh, group of medical devices. It is a class three device. It is an implantable. Uh, and therefore, uh, advancement of such a device through the whole development process, evaluation, and commercialization presents uh, some of the greatest challenges. Uh, the goal of this device, as is stated here, is to go through a pre-market approval pathway. The second case study uh, is a diagnostic device. It's a middle ear infection diagnostic device. It is first in class, and therefore, uh, it has to go through a de novo uh, pathway. Um, and Ryan will uh, detail the, that uh, particular device. So proceeding on with the uh, first um, uh, device, a pediatric heart valve, as I said before, this is a class three uh, device. Um, it is life sustaining and it is an implantable. And by definition, uh, that makes it a class three device. 
there are two ways that it can proceed, uh, and, and the way that this particular uh, device is chosen to proceed is through the uh, pre-market approval uh, pathway for regulatory approval. The problem that it's addressing um, is um, a major one. Uh, congenital cardiac defects uh, is one of the most common birth defects uh, of children. Um, and valvular heart disease, uh, as a component of congenital heart disease, accounts for about 50% of all the defects that are seen. Specifically, the pulmonary valve is the more common um, site of uh, valvular defects. Uh, lesions such as uh, tetralogy of Fallot, pulmonary stenosis, pulmonary atresia, these are all uh, defects that are um, that require some sort of intervention on the pulmonary valve because it is uh, not normally formed, uh, and therefore children um, require surgery early in life, typically, whether it's a transcatheter or um, via an open heart procedure, but nevertheless require an intervention uh, to open up the outflow, typically. Um, which leaves them with a dysfunctional uh, valve. What that means is that they have there's two options. One is to follow them medically and see how they tolerate uh, that um, uh, that problem, the, the, the pulmonary regurgitation problem, or the alternative is for them to undergo a surgical or a transcatheter intervention to place a valve, a prosthetic valve, in that position. The problem with, with placing a prosthetic valve, however, is number one, uh, size availability is limited. If you particularly if you start thinking of very young infants, um, uh, having valves that are small enough to fit uh, a, a very small child uh, is challenging. Even if you have one, durability uh, is a problem. Um, most of the valves, especially the uh, 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 biologic prostheses, even um, uh, homograph transplant type valves have a limited durability. And therefore, if you implant a valve early, uh, often the children will require multiple procedures before they get to adult age um, and in, in order to address the ongoing problems with that valve. So there is a huge need, and that need isn't uh, just for open heart implantable procedures, but there's also a need for transcatheter uh, devices as well. Transcatheter devices, have other challenges, and that is that delivery systems uh, have to be uh, of uh, a design that can navigate the small vessels of children. So these are important uh, limitations to the development. Nevertheless, the need is uh, very, very large. What are the clinical solutions? Well, first of all, um, there has to be a unique design. The valve has to function ideally at a range of sizes starting from very young infants, and as they grow, it has to be able to adapt to that growth. Um, the other more practical issues, though, beyond the design, has to be the fact that, number one, this is either still relatively uncommon problems. Unlike adult valve disease, which is far more common, uh, uh, congenital valve defects are not seen as commonly. And so if you're going to study uh, a device that you have developed, uh, you have to recognize the fact that you're going to have a ge geographically dispersed population uh, to be able to study. So what does that mean for a clinical trial design? Well, there are sample size considerations, uh, number one, because there are different sized children and different sized valves. And so that poses a much larger uh, challenge compared to uh, developing an adult sized valve, which is usually much more limited in size. There are other uncertainties which have to do with the biological response of the child to whatever material you utilize for this valve. And then finally, there are other considerations for uh, any trial that involves children, and that is that often the uh, consenting um, um, uh, patient is not the child, it's the parent of the child. Uh, and, and enrolling and recruiting patients uh, for these clinical trials can be very challenging. Parents have many questions. They're hesitant often to participate uh, in, uh, in, uh, in trials of uh, novel uh, devices that they're not familiar with. Uh, and thus, conducting a trial for a pediatric cardiac device in particular um, can take a very long time because patient recruitment uh, can be very slow. 
So as I said, for 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 innovators, um, the, the clinical trial is um, presents a, a, a significant challenge, not only for the rarity of the conditions, um, but also if they have to work with institutions, they have to ensure that that institution has experience in performing uh, these types of clinical trials. Do they have the infrastructure uh, to be able to conduct these trials so that the data can be collected uh, in a secure way? Um, and in a way that can be used for uh, both regulatory evaluation as well as also for commercialization purposes and for reimbursement. The hospital uh, also has a challenge, and that is that often um, they do not get reimbursal for the costs of these trials, even though they recognize the importance of the trial and, and their desire to participate may be there. Uh, nevertheless, there is a financial cost um, that has to be borne by someone, and often this uh, falls on the lap of the hospital. Common trial concerns from the standpoint of the uh, inventor, or I should say the startup company that is um, um, pursuing the development of this device, even for a large company that has resources, uh, they have many competing um, uh, priorities for those resources. Um, concerns about timely execution of all of the components of the trial, the parts that we don't often think about, such as contracts, the contracts with uh, particular hospitals. If you have to do a multi-center trial with multiple sites, there are multiple contracts, each one of which can take quite a long time to accomplish. There's IRB approval that's required. And again, if you have to do this for several different sites, uh, this can take a very long time and can actually go into the months of even years at times in order to complete all of this component uh, and before you enroll any patient into this trial. Even once you've gotten through the contract component and the IRB approval, uh, and as I said before, enrolling patients uh, in these trials can be challenging. Um, being able to uh, express to parents the potential value of participating in this trial uh, and at the same time explain the risk versus the potential benefit um, can be challenging. Uh, and thus enrollment uh, can be very slow. Aside from the fact that you have to ensure that there is this infrastructure that I mentioned earlier within the hospital that can uh, assist with the conduct of the trial as all of the necessary um, components that are required for, for uh, both performing the study and collecting the data and analyzing the data. You need to ensure that there's expertise uh, for trial conduct and for a, uh, a, an inventor or a startup company. Often that expertise is hard to find uh, to apply it to a small trial uh, where, where there isn't as much activity. Uh, recruiting individuals to work with you and uh, to address these problems can be very challenging. Finally, there are potential conflicts of interest. Often uh, these can be um, um, from an institution uh, that is being asked to participate in a trial, either because they may be the institution where the device came from, where it was developed, uh, or they may already be involved in a clinical trial of a similar device, and therefore uh, they have a conflict of, of uh, uh, trying to run two parallel studies on similar devices that pre definitely presents a potential conflict. For the inventor, it's a little more straightforward in the sense that if the inventor um, is, is uh, uh, um, participating in the clinical trial, obviously there's a conflict of interest, particularly if they have to do anything to do with either the implantation, the use, or the recruitment of patients uh, for that trial. In addition to just the design and development and the conduct of the trials, there are regulatory uh, challenges that have to be uh, recognized. Uh, the approval timelines uh, for particularly heart valve technologies can be long, and they can be economically challenging, raising funds to be able to not only sustain the company, but also sustain the trial, uh, particularly a, a multi-center trial, can be challenging. Um, often, on the part of inventors, there's a lack of awareness that there are is already existent FDA guidance and FDA guidance documents that give you at least a roadmap as to what data and what information needs to be collected in order to submit to the FDA for consideration for approval. 
Thus, early interaction with the FDA is ideal. However, uh, the mechanism for partnering with the FDA often is underutilized uh, by many of the, uh, of the inventors. Uh, it's the concepts of pre-submission meetings uh, and frequent meetings uh, with uh, the, the examiners um, is something that is often not uh, utilized and certainly not utilized as much as, uh, as could, uh, could be done. And this would definitely benefit uh, the, uh, the process and accelerate the process so that uh, you're not developing data that is uh, incompletely um, uh, satisfying the, the needs of the FDA in order to uh, assess the safety or the efficacy of your device. There are tools to de-risk the innovation, um, such as uh, early feasibility trials, but however, these are often underutilized uh, as a way to further uh, perfect the design of your, of your device. Um, but nevertheless, these are opportunities that, that should be taken advantage of uh, by the inventors. Finally, we've had a lot of discussion uh, already about breakthrough designation. Breakthrough designation for pediatric devices is still a concept that needs to be developed and needs to be um, uh, accepted. Nevertheless, um, it, it, the, it, or the idea of breakthrough designation as a way, uh, as a tool, for um, uh, FDA interactions as well as potentially uh, reimbursal um, um, is, is something that needs to be established. Currently, uh, this is not established for uh, pediatric medical devices. On the reimbursement side, uh, there are other obvious challenges. Um, the, uh, the cost of uh, developing a device, particularly the, the clinical trial component, are often not captured uh, in the current reimbursement. Um, and also, if you're developing codes for a, for a new uh, intervention, uh, these can be very slow in development, and often they are unpredictable. And so there are significant uh, financial uh, challenges that face the, both the um, innovator as well as the hospitals and the clinicians that are going to be using these devices. Uh, hospitals often will not buy, uh, and physicians cannot use innovative devices in the absence of adequate uh, reimbursement. Um, and the payers often face uh, significant costs uh, related to, to uh, repeat hospitalizations for the treatment of these patients. Now, this can be a double-edged sword. Uh, in the valve situation, for example, um, there is a cost to medical care. In other words, non-surgical intervention. Children that are left with defective valves often require uh, medications. They often require uh, hospitalizations, and that's a repeated cost uh, while they're waiting for a more definitive uh, therapy. Now, in that situation, the, for the payers, it would be a benefit to have a novel device enter the market if it solves that problem. Um, nevertheless, that, the, 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 um, uh, developing the proof or the data or the evidence uh, to support that contention uh, is, should be something that the inventor should be thinking about as they are uh, going through the process of, um, uh, of data generation. And finally, the breakthrough designation, uh, which we have talked about re relating more to the, to the uh, regulatory component. For the reimbursement component, uh, this does not exist. Um, in, in, I think it's, it's widely known that the, the um, reimbursement uh, scheme for pediatrics uh, is mostly for as far as governmental um, reimbursement it's mostly Medicaid, not Medicare, uh, and there are 51 uh, Medicaid programs in the United States. Each state has a separate one, and therefore there is no uniform uh, nationwide system uh, for even evaluating the concept of a breakthrough designation. So this is something that needs to be worked on uh, at, in, a, in another uh, uh, forum. To summarize the pathway um, that a uh, pediatric heart valve that is novel, that is addressing a, an unmet need, has to undergo. Uh, we can look at it under different um, um, points of view. First one is just the product development from the early concept and prototype and bench testing all the way through the uh, animal testing, both acute and chronic, eventually resulting in design freeze. At this point, often financing is required because the next steps are expensive. Uh, the final design, manufacturing design, uh, in the case of a valve, accelerated wear testing, GLP, animal studies, 
and verification and validation uh, testing, all of which is required for um, FDA submission, um, are expensive, and they also take quite a bit of time. So often the, um, um, the uh, 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 inventors have to raise a significant sum of money to get through this process before they even get to the point where uh, an initial trial uh, can be undertaken. Following that, and if an early feasibility study uh, is, um, uh, is undertaken, uh, that is an additional cost uh, to, uh, for the uh, development. And this is all before a, um, a pivotal study um, is uh, conducted, which is required for a, uh, for a pre-market approval um, uh, uh, regulatory process. Usually in that situation, a second uh, uh, fundraising round uh, is uh, conducted, it's often called the Series B, uh, and there, the, the, the amount of money that's required for that component is even uh, substantially larger. So the next question is, uh, what about other devices? What about devices that are not quite in the class three? And here I'll turn it over to my colleague, uh, Ryan Nolan. Thank you. Um, seems I don't have access to change. Okay. All right. So I'll talk, uh, now about ear infections, um, which those of you in the audience with kids out there are probably pretty familiar. Uh, ear infections are a predominantly and very prevalent, uh, pediatric issue. And the cause here is basically that the ear develops, uh, an infection, fluid builds up. Uh, they're highly prevalent, resulting in 30 million office visits annually in the U.S. Um, number one cause of hearing loss. I could go on. Uh, and why is that? Well, basically, the standard diagnostic technology out there right now um, is the ubiquitous otoscope, uh, which is basically just a magnifying glass with a flashlight a primary care clinician would utilize this technology to get a visualization of the eardrum. But the problem is that uh, this tool is subjective because you're trying to visualize through a semi-transparent tissue uh, a disease that's actually in the middle ear behind the eardrum. Um, so this makes it obviously a, a difficult diagnosis. Um, there are more advanced technologies out there for uh, improving ear diagnostic accuracy. However, these technologies are uh, ones that have challenging operational requirements. Um, and by that, I mean pneumatic otoscopy and tympanometry both require a seal of the ear canal and to maintain that seal for their whole exam, which in adult patients, um, who are way more compliant um, are it's a much easier examination uh, to undergo, but in a screaming and crying child, um, the challenges there are pretty self evident so um, because of that, the standard otoscope is kind of the standard uh, for diagnosis of ear infections in children, resulting in about a fifty percent diagnostic accuracy uh, among primary care clinicians and the resulting costs of that are first um, that this overdiagnosis directly drives overuse of antibiotics. Antibiotics for ear infections are currently the number one reason uh, for for uh, treating and, and prescribing with antibiotics. Um, and ultimately, following the current guidelines, once a child has enough ear infections over a specific period of time, the disease process ends in surgery. Um, while surgery is highly effective, it is listed as one of the top five most overused surgical procedures in all of medicine, uh, with a total of about a million per year. So with all of those uh, issues um, that I've just laid out, a Clinical solution to this um, that a major company or a, a, a startup company may develop 
would be a device that addresses a couple of key needs here. One would be a more accurate and objective determination of, first off, is there fluid in the middle ear space as depicted here uh, on this slide? And if so, is that fluid that warrants antibiotics? Um, step two, uh, that technology would need to be efficient uh, and clinically effective when performed by clinicians of all different types of experience levels in primary care. These clinicians have to be basically the front lines of healthcare, and um, they do a lot of uh, screening and, and preliminary diagnosis. So a technology that is easy uh, for these clinicians to utilize, especially in pediatric patients, um, is very important uh, to consider when designing such a product. And then lastly, um, you know, this would be used in, in both the physician office and hospital outpatient setting, basically anywhere ear infection patients may present for diagnosis and treatment. Such a technology, given some of the uh, current technologies used for diagnosis um, would likely be first in class, uh, meaning there would be no predicate device and hence why uh, this case is in its current form displayed as a de novo um, submission. But if there were predicate, uh, that would follow from a regulatory perspective um, with a 510K submission as opposed to de novo. Uh, and then lastly, um, development of such a product uh, could be influential on the ecosystem um, with respect to reducing overdiagnosis. Uh, that technology could reasonably reduce over prescription of antibiotics and uh, overuse of surgeries, thereby also uh, impacting and reducing the costs associated with um, those interventions. As far as hospital and clinical trial issues, a lot of these are similar to the class three device um, presented earlier. Um, I think pretty commonly in all clinical trials, uh, timely execution of contracts and IRB approvals, it will always be um, important. Uh, timely enrollment. Um, so to specific to this case study, um, making sure that for conducting these trials, um, they're done in institutions that um, you can look back at historical data to ensure that, you know, the, the proposed patient population is present, um, that they have the infrastructure for conducting the clinical trials, conducting clinical trials in primary care um, is pretty rare, uh, and um, especially so with pediatric primary care. Um, given that a lot of new innovations and technologies are more geared towards specialities uh, in other departments. Um, and then lastly, in, in partnering with some of the uh, a hospital on this trial, um, you know, it would be important to ensure that there is expertise in trial conduct, um, which we'll get into later. Um, and then lastly, conflicts of interest, very similarly to what was presented for the class three device. There can be institution-based or inventor-based conflicts, uh, whether that institution may already be running trials for um, a potential competitive device um, or one of the uh, inventors of the technology is based at that institution um, and that is involved in that trial as well. As far as regulatory considerations go um, for a class two device, uh, again, very similar set of um, considerations here to the class three device. Um, I won't go into um, a lot of the details that were already discussed around FDA guidance documents and, and awareness of those and, and pre-submission meetings, but those would be uh, equivalently important for this case study as well. Um, Depending on the technology utilized in this ear infection diagnostic device, um, there may be a predicate device, but if not, um, a consideration for the de novo pathway uh, through the FDA would be warranted. As far as clinical versus preclinical data generation, um, depending upon how developed such a imaging technology is, um, there may be 
uh, a multitude of clinical publications already to support the validity of the technology, but it is important to show the efficacy of that technology um, as well as the, the safety, um, even more so when considering um, pediatrics as a vulnerable population. Uh, and then also the human factors and usability challenges that I had mentioned before um, in kids affected by ear infections, um, being able to utilize the technology quickly is important um, and still maintain that accuracy. Uh, and then as far as breakthrough designation goes, um, it's it's uh, the same points as, as were mentioned earlier for the class three device. As far as reimbursement challenges go, um, primary care uh, doesn't have a lot of uh, reimbursements above and beyond uh, evaluation and management payments. Um, so the cost of developing and introducing the innovative uh, technology described in this case study um, is predominantly and, and most likely not captured in the current reimbursement. Therefore, you're left with a decision to either um, evaluate the current reimbursement for tympanometry um, or uh, if there is a parallel there or proceeding with um, a decision between establishing a new uh, CPT code for uh, the technology, which would then lead to, do you proceed with a category one versus category three CPT code? or do you utilize an unlisted code? There's benefits and drawbacks to both, but that type of uh, decision-making is something that um, would warrant some consulting on. Uh, hospitals and clinics, same with the class three device, would likely not buy and, and utilize um, this case study's innovative technology in the absence of adequate reimbursement. Primary care is very cost sensitive uh, and cost averse. So making sure that the economics make sense is equally as important as uh, the accuracy and safety of the technology in the primary care um, pediatric setting. And then uh, the pathway to establishing such new uh, or innovative coverage and payment policies is complicated and difficult, just like with class three devices um, and especially for private payers. So in summary, uh, again, um, here is presented a, a timeline of this case study wherein such a technology, uh, a class two imaging technology, would start with uh, concept and early, early prototype ideation through be bench testing, uh, necessary animal studies uh, to prove out the, the technology itself, which would then require a Series A financing round to proceed with um, a clinical efficacy study and, and through manufacturing design and freeze and verification and validation. Um, alternatively, there are, if, if the technology is being developed by a uh, small business, there are um, small business grants uh, through the SBIR um, approach with NIH, NSF, um, and other institutions that could be utilized in parallel. Um, but uh, leading up to FDA submission then after verification and validation, typically a Series B financing would be raised for conducting a post-market study. Uh, and then these studies uh, would be for evaluating two major things. One would be health outcomes, looking at an interventional play for this type of technology, as well as uh, looking at the downstream economic impact of this technology, which would be important from a reimbursement perspective, especially so for private payers. So with that, uh, we'll, we'll summarize here before our panel discussion with uh, how can SHIP MD help? And I'll pass back off to Dr. Del Nido. Uh, thank you, Ryan. So, I hope we didn't leave you depressed. Um, it's, a, it's a challenging um, pathway, but um, I think it's a realistic pathway for uh, two types of devices. One, obviously, a very uh, high-risk device, but potentially a huge impact. Uh, it could change the lives of uh, many, many children. Uh, the other is a less uh, lower-risk device that also could have huge impact and probably a broader population um, uh, 
therefore it's a worthwhile effort. The question then becomes uh, how can SHIP MD uh, in its current proposed form, how can it help? Well, there are many, many components. First of all, on the regulatory, um, it can be a, um, a resource of information. It can educate the developers, the pediatric device developers, on all of the regulatory programs that are relevant to their particular device and to their particular development process. Um, and that way they can facilitate the interactions with the regulators, um, both in the form of making direct contacts and identifying the relevant review offices, um, and also encouraging the frequent interaction uh, between the, the device developers and the, uh, and the regulatory agencies. Furthermore, I think the, the important part of SHIP is that it can provide a framework uh, for the pediatric device developers to think about how uh, they would strategize, how they would, they would um, navigate through both the regulatory as well as the reimbursement process. So having someone with experience uh, who understands the, the, both of these uh, components uh, to be able to help you uh, devise a strategy for how you're going to bring this uh, device through this um, uh, through this development process uh, is important, and it could be um, extremely um, um, significant from the standpoint of shortening uh, the timeline that it takes to develop. Both, ideally, in avoiding mistakes, um, and, and especially timely mistakes uh, or time uh, uh, time expensive mistakes. Um, as well as um, uh, get to the right uh, uh, knowledge base quickly uh, so that you can make decisions uh, on a relatively short timeline. And in cases where you have a device that um, um, it, it could benefit from uh, also post-market uh, uh, data collection, um, how to strategize a, a, um, a regulatory approval process that balances both. Uh, pre-approval uh, data as well as post-market uh, data um, that satisfies the needs of the regulatory um, agency as well as um, uh, your, your, the speed of getting this uh, to the market. How can it help in the hospital clinical trial process? Well, um, here's probably where one of the uh, biggest benefits of having a structured organization that brings uh, hospitals um, uh, together with inventors to advance a, um, a device. Um, as I mentioned earlier, some of the uh, requirements for working with a hospital are execution of contracts um, and um, IRB approvals. If you can imagine a process where uh, the, the contracts are standardized, uh, so that um, the, the whole process of conducting a negotiation of a contract uh, can be done simultaneously uh, with the different sites that you're hoping to, to uh, include in your study uh, and similarly have a more unified or at least structured IRB approval process. Uh, this would be a tremendously helpful in, the, uh, uh, in accelerating the, the, the clinical trial uh, uh, development as well as the conduct. And I think providing a, a site that has experience and has the expertise to be able to conduct a trial also is a huge benefit for the inventor. Um, thus, you don't have to educate the site. The site uh, knows what to do um, and often helps you avoid many of the traps of, of uh, conducting clinical trials uh, in, a, in, in children within a hospital. And uh, the other practical issue is just providing access to sufficient numbers of patients so that you can get your clinical study, even if it's an early feasibility study uh, that, is, uh, that is collecting a limited amount of, of uh, number of patients, uh, it still will require time. Uh, and, and patient enrollment, patient accrual can take a very long time. Uh, and having uh, the, the uh, a more accelerated process, again, is, is a huge value. Um, and a cost saving for a uh, for a startup company. Um, selecting the sites, particularly sites that may have more experience with a particular device or, or have expertise in a particular uh, area of medical care, 
would be uh, also um, uh, quite helpful. Um, and this all goes towards the um, financial aspects of it. That is, if you're going to budget for a, um, a clinical trial cost, which is by and large the most expensive uh, component of um, um, advancing a, a pediatric device to the to uh, um, for commercialization, um, predictability of the cost. Uh, is a is a, 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 a tremendous advantage that SHIP could bring to the uh, developer. On the reimbursement side, um, this is an area that it still needs to be developed. Um, the the um, uh, assistance with uh, with uh, identifying codes or identifying a a, um, uh, a similar way to to um, um, be able to to um, request reimbursement for your device and for your procedure. Uh, is uh, extremely valuable, um, and also identifying uh, the the, um, uh, the the areas where you could get higher levels of reimbursement uh, would be extremely valuable to the um, uh, to the device developer. Certainly, increase the overall value of the technology uh, if you're able to demonstrate that you can get reimbursement and that you can get um, uh, a higher level of reimbursement uh, because of the uh, innovative quality of your device. Explaining to payers the cost savings um, of, of your uh, particular technology, particularly if you're actually saving hospitalizations or saving additional uh, care, um, um, helping you generate the evidence so that you can approach the payers with that um, uh, with that data um, is a um, one aspect of SHIP that uh, would uh, provide a, a, a tremendous asset for this uh, process. So in looking at the timeline, where in this timeline can SHIP uh, actually have an impact? Well, in fact, pretty much throughout the whole process. Um, and this is what we're going to discuss to some degree during the navigation session uh, tomorrow. Uh, where do you enter SHIP if you're a, a, a device developer or an inventor? You can enter in many, uh, in, in almost any time during the, this, this timeline. Uh, because there are many opportunities. Uh, SHIP can help you uh, in the early phases um, by um, engaging champions within uh, the, uh, the within SHIP. It can help you interact with FDA, establish uh, those connections for you. Um, they can uh, assist you by providing uh, regulatory services. They can assist you in the process of um, uh, preparing for a pre-submission meeting and identifying the type of information that you will need and the benefit risk analysis that will be required. Um, and then um, in, in the uh, IDE uh, submission or a pre-IDE meeting, um, have provide a champion that will help you engage with the FDA uh, in, in the process of discussing the uh, clinical trial design. And then other areas such as breakthrough designation can also be uh, an area where SHIP can uh, can interact. So there are many uh, uh, areas in the timeline where a device can enter a uh, SHIP, uh, navigate through the either the entire process all the way towards a pivotal trial if it's a class three device, uh, or exit at some point once the the um, uh, the, the need has been satisfied. Um, and, uh, exit from SHIP and go on and pursue um, the, uh, uh, your own development uh, as you see fit. Turning it over to Ryan. Yeah, so back to the, the timeline for the Class II device. Um, the impact of SHIP here could be realized along the green timeline, wherein um, you know, coming out of the early concept prototype stage, uh, likely out of a university or hospital um, innovation group, uh, the this type of technology, um, you know, entering into ship could engage with champions and FDA liaisons early on um, through pre-submission meeting um, or other avenues, um, but facilitated largely by participation in ship. And then as um, this technology goes through design and development, um, providing regulatory services uh, would be of benefit to help streamline that submission process, identifying if there are 
uh, predicates out there and um, based on that decision making and the evidence present, um, do you need to do clinical studies prior to FDA submission? Um, what needs to be collected? That type of information um, would be of most benefit so that you can conduct ideally one study um, to collect all the information you need for that FDA submission. Um, if there is breakthrough designation to be had for such a technology, that's also an important um, item to discuss prior to FDA submission. And then lastly, coming out the other side um, of either a de novo or 510K submission um, based on the circumstances of the technology, uh, conducting that post-market health outcomes and economic impact study, that's something that um, the SHIP ecosystem and the reimbursement resources uh, would be able to help support and facilitate, ideally. So with that, uh, Dr. Del Nino and I thank everyone for your attention throughout our presentation, and we'll be switching now over to our panel discussion.